Welcome back to the channel and to our budget-friendly Volkswagen diesel-powered Chevy S10 project. That sounds weird when I say it out loud, but that's what we're doing. Over the past few weeks, we've made a lot of progress, and I recommend you check out our previous videos if this sort of thing interests you. Anyway, we're working on the handful of final details to get this truck back on the road as soon as possible. Today, we're going to focus on the exhaust system plus a few other things. And later on in the video, we'll talk about this thing. Ah yes, a blast from the past. So without any delay, let's get started. One of the challenges we're facing right now is finding a way to route the exhaust system from the manifold to the underside of the truck, and the only place we can go through is this opening. All other pathways are blocked by either the starter or the massive cross member. This is the only option, and it's not a lot of space. Plus, the exhaust has to do a lot of twisting and turning to get through this hole. Now, the exhaust manifold that we're using is made for a T3 turbo flange, which is awesome, and yes, at some point, we will slap a turbo here. But right now, our plans are to get the truck back on the road without a turbo. One step at a time, folks. Anyway, the first step in building the exhaust system is to come up with a flange that'll bolt to the exhaust manifold. And since this is a T3 manifold, there are actually a lot of low-cost solutions to make this connection. So, we're going to be using this T3 to 2.5 inch adapter to build the bridge between the manifold and the tubular exhaust. This adapter is going to kind of be used backwards in this application, but it should be fine. Anyway, this part was only 30 bucks, which is a great price. However, the 2.5 inch exhaust is way too big and we really need a 2 inch exhaust. The problem with going with a T3 to 2 inch adapter is the price. And something like that is hella expensive for some reason. So we'll make the larger pipe work. The next part we'll need is something that'll get the exhaust pointing in kind of the right direction. And this 90 degree elbow was sourced for another 30 bucks. Now we're going in eh, the right direction. It pays to have a plan and to shop around. To mate these two parts together, we're going to be using V-clamps. Now, I love V-clamps because, well, who doesn't love them? They're quick and they provide a bit of adjustability. Now, the nuts that come with these cheapo V-clamps are pure garbage and they should be tossed in the trash. For reasons that are not clear, these nuts will actually jam up after the first time you install them and there's no way to get them off. So, we got rid of the nut that came with these V-clamps and we're going to double nut the clamps to hold them in place. If you've played with this stuff, you know what I'm talking about. So the primary pipe is positioned in approximately the right direction, and it's clear we may have an interference issue with the inner wheel well of the truck. So just to make sure we're going in the right direction, let me install the wheel well and confirm we have enough space. Fast forward a few minutes and the wheel well is installed, and it looks like we're going to have plenty of clearance as far as the wheel well goes. Although we are starting to run out of space for other things. Let's go to the bench and work this out. So these are most of the parts we'll need to route the exhaust under the truck and still have more than enough space for the starter. As you can see, I've already cut the end off this 90 degree elbow and that's going to shorten the elbow so we can weld in a 2.5 inch to 2 inch reducer. From this point, the rest of the exhaust system is going to be 2 inch. Anyway, we have a 45 degree pipe and another 45 degree pipe. These guys will allow us to snake around the frame rail and the cab of the truck. We'll have to add another 45 at the end, but before we can do that, we have to weld up the parts we already have. Fast forward a little bit and we're making some progress. In order to get the pipes to line up, I'm using masking tape to hold these sections in position. And basically, I have to fit this exhaust pipe to the truck every time I add a section to line stuff up. Then I tape the part in position so we can tack weld it. The tape works great to hold the parts for a few minutes until I can zap the metal with the MIG welder.
All right, well, it took me most of the afternoon to fabricate this, and this completed section of the exhaust is the solution to get the exhaust to go from the engine to the stock exhaust system on the truck. Basically, everything after this flexible joint is a straight shot to the existing exhaust system. Now, in order to get this to work, I will have to add a new exhaust hanger on the truck to keep the weight of the existing exhaust from affecting this flexible connection. That's not a big deal, and I'll do that off camera. Let's slide this part in and have a look. So right over here, you can see where the exhaust actually comes in contact with the transmission adapter, and that's intentional. You see, once I pull the engine and transmission to do the oil pan, I'll fabricate a bracket that'll anchor this head pipe to the aluminum adapter, and that'll prevent any rattles. The exhaust on a diesel engine is a lot cooler than the exhaust on a gasoline engine, and this won't be a problem. So at this point, we have the exhaust system figured out, and now we can move on to something else. So for the alternator placement on this engine, there's not a lot of options. And I want to keep this area clear for the future turbo. This area over here is very congested and among other things, the alternator would actually come in contact with the steering shaft. So probably the best location for the alternator is in the stock location. However, in this location, the belt adjustment was intended to be done by moving the air conditioner compressor, which should sit right under the alternator. Obviously, we don't have the AC compressor and we don't have room for it. So we're going to need to come up with a way to adjust the alternator belt. So this stock alternator bracket is non-adjustable and the plan is to modify the bracket so we can have some adjustment in order to tighten the belt. This bracket has a unique shape and length because it's from a car that was equipped with air conditioning. Unfortunately, we can't replace it with a stock Volkswagen bracket that is adjustable. It turns out those brackets are way too short for this application. So we're going to have to modify this bracket by welding on an extension that has an adjustment slot. Here, let me show you the plan. This chunk of steel is the same thickness as the alternator bracket and I've already drawn out the shape of the extension that we're going to be welding onto the stock Volkswagen bracket. Now in order to make the slot we're going to first drill a series of holes to remove most of the material. Then we'll use a file to remove the rest of the material. It's pretty simple so let's get started. And there you go, we now have a slot for our belt adjustment. Now doing this with hand tools is actually a lot faster than setting up my mill. Eh, the slot's not perfect, but it's good enough for YouTube. Let's cut this section out and weld it to the Volkswagen part. All right, well, I'm about to weld these two parts together, but I wanted to show you a close-up of how these parts will get welded. As you can see, I used a grinder to remove the material on both sides of the weld, and this will allow better weld penetration. And later on, we can use a grinder to clean up the weld for a clean appearance. Let's do it. Oh, for my crappy welder, I'm way more comfortable preheating the metal before welding. You know, I do this a lot off camera, and I found this really helps my little MIG welder to get better penetration.
Fast forward a little bit and the part's painted and ready to be installed. Let's see how it fits. All right, it fits and it actually works. Not too shabby. That's one more thing we can scratch off the list. Now we're definitely getting closer to our goal. Nice. So this old school diesel engine doesn't need a whole bunch of wires in order to make it run, and the Chevy wire harness was modified by removing a few wires. Right now I have a current limiting power supply feeding 12 volts into the harness, and I want to verify the circuits we kept are still working correctly. Now the wires we'll be using come from this bulkhead connector, and this connector is the gateway for the headlights, the taillights, the fuel pump, the instrument panel, and the ignition switch wires. Over on the other side of the truck, there's a hole in the firewall. This hole was the penetration point for all the wires for the electronic fuel injection on the Iron Duke gasoline engine. Nearly all these wires go directly to the PCM, sometimes called the ECU. You know, the computer thingy that scares a lot of people for some reason. Anyway, if you pull the PCM and the harness that's connected to it, that eliminates a huge chunk of the harness under the hood. So say goodbye to a lot of unnecessary wires. At this point, all we're left with is a few wires that we need to check. The first wire is this purple guy. This wire goes to this terminal on the starter, and it's what tells the starter to do its thing. Right now we have this purple wire connected to the multimeter, and when I turn the ignition switch to crank, we should see 12 volts on this wire. Let's give that a try. And yeah, we get the crank signal on the purple wire. Excellent. This pink wire used to go to the ignition coil on the Iron Duke engine, and now we're going to use it to send power to the fuel solenoid on the injector pump. This solenoid needs 12 volts in order to pull the valve open to allow fuel to flow to the pump. Without the 12 volts, this engine will not run. So in order to shut the engine off, you actually have to remove the 12 volts and the engine will die. So when I turn the ignition switch to run, we get the required 12 volts, and we still have the required 12 volts when I turn the key to crank. So this circuit is working perfectly. The last circuit we need to check is for the alternator. This black wire from the Chevy harness will send 12 volts to the alternator. However, on this circuit, the 12 volt passes through a light bulb first, kind of like this. Now this is the exact circuit the Volkswagen alternator wants to see in order for it to work correctly. Actually, this is how a lot of older alternators with an internal regulator are wired to work. And it just happens that the Chevy wiring harness is compatible with the VW alternator. So let's try this circuit. And yep, we get the 12 volts on the black wire. Perfect. So the only other signal we definitely need is something to energize the glow plug relay. And for this, I'm just going to wire a push button on the dashboard. Meh, for this truck, we don't need a fancy glow plug timer. You see, a push button is going to be just fine. Now the speedometer and the fuel gauge wires also go through this bulkhead and they should still work. However, I'm not going to be testing them today. Anyway, except for the glow plug relay, the wire harness is good to go for launch when we finally light this candle. And that's coming up real soon. I'm sure a lot of you folks are looking forward to that. And now for something completely different. So if you're an old school gearhead like myself, well, performance cars from the past are always interesting. You know, an old Camaro in this condition deserves a second look, and when you get up close to it, you can see it's actually an IROC Z. Meh, back in the day, most of these cars didn't have a lot going on under the hood. Now, if we look even closer, we can see this guy actually has a 5.7 liter V8, or as we say in America, a 350. Alright, that's a lot better. From what I understand, most of these cars came with a 305, and the 350 option wasn't available until a few years later. The 350 upgrade didn't make a lot of power by today's standards, but it was definitely a lot better than the 305. You know, what would make this even better is, that's right, a manual transmission. So what are the chances this guy has a stick shift in it? Holy cow, a 4-speed or a 5-speed gearbox. In my opinion, that's what makes this car worth saving. So what you're looking at is a 1989 Camaro IROC Z with a 350 and a manual transmission. I really wish I could say this was going to be my car. But a good friend of mine and part-time cameraman, Eric, just bought this car and it's going to be a father and son project. So this car is definitely in good hands. Unfortunately, the previous owner of the car passed away about three years ago and the car was more or less forgotten and pushed off to the side. There's absolutely no information on this buggy other than the car was in the process of being repaired or modified. 
In the back of the car, we can see some loose parts, and it looks like there's two sets of TPI manifolds. So that's interesting. I wonder what's actually under the hood. Overall, this car is a bit shabby, but it's in really good condition for its age. Let's pop the hood and take a look. Well, that's definitely a tree fitty, or at least most of the tree. <laughs> you know, a few weeks ago when I checked this car out for the first time, you could actually still see the valve covers. Now it looks like the engine compartment has received some fresh leaves and a few more twigs. So given that the TPI intake manifold is not on the engine and it's in the back of the car, this is not an ideal situation. And if any of this debris has gotten into the valley, well, there could be some serious engine damage. It's definitely going to take a hazmat team to dig out this engine compartment, that's for sure. So today's goal is not going to be, will it run? I think we're way beyond that right now, and that would be pointless. Instead, we're going to clear the area of the tall grass and load this car up onto the trailer and haul it back to my shop. So fast forward a few minutes and the Camaro's on the tow dolly. Now, the dolly's not the greatest solution, but we only have to go a few miles, so it should be okay. It's amazing, but all four wheels spin and the tires actually have plenty of air in them. The car, it's looking a lot better. When I was connecting the safety chains under the car, the underside appeared to be very solid. And the few years that it's been sitting in the tall grass haven't taken their toll. So that's very nice. And it's gone. Well, sort of. It's on its way to my shop. Fast forward a few minutes and the Camaro has arrived safely. Hopefully, whatever was living under the hood is still a few miles away. It certainly took a lot of work to fill this engine compartment with all those sticks, and it's going to take a while to remove all of them. Now right over here, you can still see one of the valve covers, so there's definitely an engine under all this mess. Anyway, the valve cover is painted Chevy orange, which is interesting. It should be painted black for this year of Camaro. Now I ain't touching any of this crap, and it's up to the cameraman to clean out the engine bay. You know the deal. Gloves, a mask, and all that. It's going to take a lot of digging and cleaning in order to get this engine bay somewhat normal again. Now I did take a peek at the box of extra parts, and I found an instruction sheet for installing a four-barrel intake manifold and some quadrajet parts. So it's possible this engine has been fitted with a different intake manifold and a carburetor. If that's the case, well, there's a chance this engine might be salvageable. The sticker on the license plate indicates the car was last on the road in 2016, which is not good news, but it's not terrible news either. We do know that the car was being worked on three years ago, so it's hard to say what sort of surprise are in store. I actually think that there's a good chance that this car has been stored indoors for most of its life because it's actually in really good condition for its age. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this is not my car and it's going to be my buddy's father and son project. So what that means is it's not going to be getting a diesel engine of any sort. Actually, I would never do that to this car. One way or another, the 350 will live again. Unfortunately, I'm out of time this week and we'll have to dig deeper into this very cool semi-vintage Camaro in a future episode. So the good news is the car has been rescued and it's in a safe place now. We'll see you next time. Until then.